Hello, Biology 400 students. This is Mr. Gales, and today I'm going to be going through the structure and function of macromolecules study guide with you. What I'll do is go through each of the interactive questions that you were assigned during the learning units, and then we'll go over some of the review problems at the end of the study guide packet. Um, these pages are pages 37 through 45 in your organic chemistry packet. Okay, and we're going to begin with, <clears throat> on page 38, uh, interactive question 5.1. And when we're looking at monosaccharides. One way that you can identify a monosaccharide when you look at it is to identify obviously the elements that are present. Carbohydrates have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. The other thing that you can look at is that in a monosaccharide each carbon except one bears a hydroxyl group. Okay, so if you see all those carbons and you have a hydroxyl group on each one except one, that's a good indication. The remaining carbon atom bears a carbonyl group. Okay, carbonyl is that carbon double bonded to oxygen. The location of the carbonyl determines whether it is an aldose sugar or a ketose sugar. Right? If it's a, an aldehyde carbonyl group, which occurs at the end of a chain, then it's an aldose sugar. If it is a ketone functional group, which we see within the chain, then it's a ketose sugar. In aqueous solutions, most monosaccharides form rings. So you should be prepared to identify carbohydrates in straight chains, linear straight chains. Those would be pure carbohydrates outside of aqueous solutions, or looking at a carbohydrate that has formed a ring. And we can see if we look here at interactive question 5.2, these are glucose molecules that are in the ring shape. So these would appear as though they would, were in an aqueous solution. Okay. Interactive question 5.2 asks you to circle the atoms of these two glucose molecules that will be removed by a dehydration synthesis reaction, and then draw the resulting maltose molecule with its 1,4 glycosidic linkage. So first of all, what we're going to do is um, go through and number the carbon atoms on each of these glucose molecules. This is a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then six is this one that sticks up in the air like this. So again, it's a it, the chemical formula for this will be C6H12O6. Each one of those glucose molecules has the same chemical formula. It's in the one to two to one ratio. That's one way to identify it as being a carbohydrate, a monosaccharide. Here again, one, two, three, four, five, and six up on top. Okay. The atoms that will be involved in the dehydration reaction <clears throat> are here. We're going to take off a hydroxyl group on one side and then just a hydrogen atom on the other uh, glucose molecule. And what we'll have left over, and I'm just going to do a rough drawing of this. I'm not going to draw in all the additional atoms. Uh, what we'll have left over is like this with the oxygen atom that was here. So that would be your uh, maltose molecule that is produced. And the 1,4 glycosidic linkage is here. This is carbon number one on this glucose molecule. This is carbon number four on the other glucose molecule. So this is the 1,4 glycosidic linkage that you see right there. That's the bond that is characteristic of uh, carbohydrates when they go from monosaccharide to disaccharide and then eventually to polysaccharide. Okay, we're going to move along to interactive question 5.5. This is asking us to sketch a section of phospholipid bilayer and label the hydrophilic head and the hydrophobic tail on one of the phospholipids. So the, the way the phospholipid bilayer is arranged, we can just identify the phosphate group as a circle, and then we generally just show two tails for each of the phospholipid, the, the fatty acid chains on the bottom. So we've got a collection of these phospholipids like this. And then the, the fact that it's a bilayer is indicated by the fact that we have another layer of phospholipids, but this time they're lined up with tails facing the, the first layer. Okay, and I'm going to grab the model so you can see.
Here's the structure that we're looking at on that drawing. The phosphate group is just the circular group up at the top, and then we have the two fatty acid chains hanging down. When we have a bilayer construction, we've got this kind of arrangement. Right. The heads are hydrophilic, and the tails are hydrophobic. And this kind of molecule where we have both hydrophilic and hydrophobic or polar and nonpolar on the same molecule is referred to as an amphipathic molecule. Okay. Now, a critical component of the phospholipids, remember this is a, a slightly different from a simple fat or triglyceride because it's got the glycerol at the center, it's got two fatty acid chains, and then it's got a phosphate group in place of that third fatty acid. Okay, interactive question 5-6. Here we're going to draw the amino acid alanine and serine, and we're going to show how a dehydration reaction will form a peptide bond between them. So for an amino acid, you should have an amino group, central carbon atom with the hydrogen atom on it. Now alanine, the R group is just CH3, so I'm going to draw it just that way, CH3. And then we have the carboxyl group that would be coming off like this. We're going to add another amino acid, so the same basic shape, the amino group, central carbon atom with the hydrogen atom. The R group in this case for serine is CH2OH. And then we have another carboxyl group here. Right. Now again, the parts that are going to be pulled off for the dehydration synthesis reaction would be the hydroxyl group on the, the carboxyl, and then the amino where it is going to lose one of its hydrogen atoms. So we'll pull this. That is going to produce water. Okay. And so our peptide bond is essentially going to be between the carbon here that you see and this nitrogen here. So one indication when you're looking at organic molecules, if you see this NCC, NCC repeating pattern, you know you have at least a dipeptide. Depending on how many times you see that repeating pattern, you may have either a dipeptide, tripeptide, or a polypeptide. The groups that has the polar R group, well, the polar R group is going to be serine. And the reason for that is that serine has oxygen in it. This hydroxyl group is going to make this polar. Remember, oxygen is very electronegative. It's going to want to pull electrons. That means it's going to be polar. The nonpolar R group is alanine. Just carbon and hydrogen together is going to be nonpolar covalent bonds. All right, and then down here again, I mentioned the NCC repeating sequence. We see NCC. This would be a peptide bond right here. NCC, another peptide bond right over here. So we have three amino acids that have been joined together in this uh, molecule. So this would be a tripeptide. Okay. It would be acceptable if you put down polypeptide for this one as well. Generally, if we have two amino acids together, we want to call that a dipeptide. Okay. So here are our peptide bonds. here and here. Okay, let's move on to the next interactive question. 5.7 is going to look at how the tertiary structure of a protein is held together by these, these interactions between different parts of the amino acid chain. This one here, these are called hydrophobic bonds. And the reason they're hydrophobic bonds is you can see it's all carbon and hydrogen together. So those are all nonpolar uh, our groups, and they're going to interact with each other to exclude water, basically, is the, the essence of that. So those are hydrophobic bonds. Over here, we're going to see this is a hydrogen bond. Now, if you notice, this is this R group here is CH2OH. The OH is polar because of the oxygen, so it's going to form a partially negative end by the oxygen and a partially positive end by the hydrogen. This R group down over here, has a double bonded oxygen and so this one is going to be partially negative negative. and so when you have partial positive and partial negative interactions between hydrogen and another nearby uh, negative atom on a nearby molecule that would be a hydrogen bond okay down here <clears throat> we have a positive ammonium ion and a negative oxide ion these are ions in these R groups so this kind of interaction is simply going to be an ionic interaction or ionic bond and then finally here we have the two sulfur atoms in each of the R groups. That's what is called a disulfide 
bridge. So the general idea here is that there, you have bonds or interactions between non-adjacent amino acids. Uh, these are amino acids that are not near each other on the chain. And they cause this folding that you see here where the top of the chain is going to have a connection between a, a part of the chain that's lower down. And um, what that does is it provides a three-dimensional shape for that protein. The three-dimensional shape, the tertiary structure, the three-dimensional shape is what determines the function. If it loses that three-dimensional shape due to what we call denaturing, whether it's um, excessive temperature breaking these bonds or uh, changes in pH breaking the bonds, if that occurs, it loses that three-dimensional shape and therefore the protein won't function correctly. <clears throat> Okay, 510, we talked about this one in class. Um, flow of genetic information starts with DNA in the nucleus. We're talking about eukaryotic cells here. That flows to RNA, which is another type of nucleic acid which carries the genetic information out of the nucleus into the ribosomes, where finally protein is produced. All right, and then interactive question 511 is labeling the three parts of the nucleotide and then indicating with the arrow where the phosphate group of the next nucleotide would attach to build the polynucleotide. So this, of course, is the nitrogenous base. Uh, we don't see the nitrogen atoms here, but when you're looking at a nucleotide, um, the only thing that would be a ring structure other than the central carbon-based uh, structure would be the nitrogenous base. It's also always going to be attached to carbon number one there. Okay, here, this central substance we have, this is called deoxyribose. That's the five carbon sugar. And we know that this is deoxyribose because here on carbon number two, we have just a hydrogen atom. If this was a hydroxyl group, we'd be looking at ribose. Right. We have carbon number three over here, carbon four, and then number carbon number five will stick up on top and the last part of the phosphate uh, of the nucleotide would be the phosphate group okay so the questions that go beyond this a little bit uh, first of all draw the arrow to indicate where the phosphate group of this nucleotide will bond with the sugar of the next that occurs here at carbon three we call that a, a three five or a five three phosphodiester bond you'll see that a little bit later as we move through the rest of the study guide this nucleotide is a pyrimidine, and we know that because this is a single ring nitrogenous base, and it is DNA because this contains deoxyribose and not ribose. Okay, moving along to page 43, this is where we get into the structure of your knowledge. Structure of knowledge number two asks you to identify the monomer or group shown by the for chem structural formulas here, and then match the chemical formulas with their descriptions. So here, when we look at this, I'm just going to take you through the process of how you would identify these structures uh, if you were unsure. The elements present, I have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. So those four elements are found in proteins. So I know this is related to a protein, and it's a single building block. This is an amino group that's become ionized, and this is a carboxyl group that's become ionized. So this is an amino acid. Another way you can identify that is that it has the central carbon atom, with a hydrogen atom. In this case, the R group is just a single hydrogen atom. All right, here, uh, this molecule, molecule B, it's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So that could be a carbohydrate or it could be a lipid. Remember, carbohydrates are going to exist in either a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio or very close to a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And when I count this up, I see um, hydro lots of carbon and hydrogen. I see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 carbons. I see a total of, what is that, 10? 11 hydrogens, but I only see two oxygens, so it's not even close to a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. That tells me it's got to be a lipid, and it's not a complete triglyceride, obviously, because it's just one um, chain. What I do notice here is that all the carbons are single bonded together, so this is a saturated fatty acid. All right. Molecule C. Uh, here we see carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen together. So this one is a little bit difficult to, to identify based on the types of atoms that are present, but what we can notice is that it's a double ring containing lots of nitrogen. And where we see that is in nitrogenous bases. So that tells me this is a nitrogenous base. It's a double ring. So this is a purine nitrogenous base.
Okay, molecule D. This looks like a carbohydrate, but again, if you notice the, the ratio of atoms, it's not 1 to 2 to 1. It's close. The other thing you can tell is that it does not have a carbonyl group. It's got hydroxyl groups, but it doesn't have a carbonyl group. This one's a little bit tricky. Uh, this is glycerol. This is a three-carbon alcohol. If you think about the word glycerol, it sounds like at the end there, the all, right? It sounds like that alcohol. So that's where the hydroxyl groups are present. This one's easy. This is just a functional group. This is a phosphate group. Here we have, again, we have a ring shape. What kind of molecule is it? Well, I see carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We know that if in an organic molecule, if the atom is not indicated, wherever we have these bends between the lines or the intersection between the lines are carbons. So I have a total of five carbons there. One, two, three, four, five up on the top. So when I look at the ratio, this isn't a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. So this is a carbohydrate. It's a monosaccharide because of the pure 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. And it is five carbons. We call those pentose sugars. And the other thing that I can tell for this is carbon number two has a hydroxyl group on it. And the pentose that we've learned about that has the hydroxyl group attached to it is called ribose. So I can get pretty specific with that one. Okay, the last molecule I have here, letter G, this is a, again, this, it's carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So you've got to break down whether it's a carbohydrate or a lipid. You've got three carbons. You've got one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens, and you've got one, two, three oxygen. So it is a one to two to one ratio. Uh, this is a, another monosaccharide. And this is where we saw, in one of the earlier interactive questions, we saw that every carbon has a hydroxyl group except one which has the carbonyl group attached to it. So this is actually called an aldose sugar because the carbonyl is on the, the first carbon in the chain. So now we have all those identified. Now we need to go back and do the matching that go along with those. Okay, molecules that would combine to form a fat. I know that Fats, triglycerides, are composed of glycerol. That's the three-carbon structure that forms the base. So D would be an answer there. And then fatty acids. Okay, there would be three fatty acids. Each fatty acid is going to be attached to one of the carbons in the glycerol. So D and B is the answer for that one. Number two, molecules that would be attached to other monomers by a peptide bond. Peptide bonds are formed between amino acids. So that one is letter A. Molecules are groups that would combine to form a nucleotide. Nucleotides are the building blocks of nucleic acids. They contain five carbon sugars, the, the either deoxyribose or ribose. In this case, we have ribose here as letter F. They have the nitrogenous base. In this case, we have a purine nitrogenous base. And they have the phosphate group. So we have F, C, and E for that one. Molecules that are carbohydrates. All right, carbohydrates, we had here uh, F and G. Even though ribose is part of a nucleotide, it is still a carbohydrate. Molecule that is a purine. Purines are types of nitrogenous bases. That's letter C. That's the double ring structure. Monomer of a protein. That's a building block of a protein. We know that those are amino acids, so that's going to be letter A. And then groups that would be joined by phosphodiester bonds. Phosphodiester bonds are those strong covalent bonds that exist between nucleotides. However, it's not between nitrogenous bases and other nitrogenous bases. The, the bond that is a phosphodiester bond exists between the five carbon sugar, in this case ribose, and the phosphate group. Okay, so we would have for here F and E. Okay? All right, the matching glycogen is a carbohydrate, cholesterol is a lipid. RNA is a type of nucleic acid. Collagen is a type of protein. It's a connective tissue in our body. And hemoglobin is also a type of protein. If I go on to the next page, uh, gene. And let's see. Gene would be uh, nucleic acid. They're in the right order, so I can just kind of do them this way. Uh, a triacylglycerol, this is a fancy way of saying triglyceride. That's a lipid, so that would be B. Enzymes, that's an example of a protein. That would be C. Cellulose, complex carbohydrate, a polysaccharide, so that's A. 
and chitin is also a complex carbohydrate A. Okay. And then for the remainder of the study guide, you had some multiple choice questions. I'm not going to go through and explain every single one of those, but I will put up the uh, answer key on Blackboard so that you have access to looking at the answers for the multiple choice questions. And if you have any questions about any of these study guide um, items that we went over, obviously post them in the discussion board on Blackboard. You can email myself or Mr. Workman um, or come on in for some help in the morning. Okay. This was looking at the study guide for macromolecules, structure and function of macromolecules, pages 37 to 45. And this is Mr. Gale signing off until next time.